It's so good to, um, to be here. Just felt this incredible welcome from those of you that know Gordon and myself. Um, it's been a number of years that we've not been here. We've been living in Elmira and are currently at WMB Church. And I'm just so uh, blessed by your welcome. And for those of you that I don't know, I just feel you're welcome as well. So thank you so much. And I want to welcome you as well. Welcome to the new year, the new decade, uh, 2020. It's a big one. Have any of you made any resolutions this year? <laughs> Not that you're willing to admit to. How about previous years? Anything in previous years? Um, well, some people that do make resolu re resolutions at the beginning of the year, they can take a lot of different forms. Um, they might involve things around our health and things that we want to change in our diet or exercise or how much screen time we want to take. Um, maybe they are about how we spend our time and achieving a better work life and family balance. Or maybe they are about our priorities, how we want to spend our money, how we want to take care of the earth. Maybe they're personal goals and how we relate to others around us. And it sounds to me like maybe a lot of us do more of uh, the next screen where it talks about casual promises. Casual promises are a little bit easier to make maybe than resolutions, right? Because there's no obligation to fulfill them. And then we won't fail if we don't meet them. Uh, for those of us who do make resolutions, and it doesn't seem like there's many of us here, but often, unfortunately, what happens is our behavior on December 31st and January 2nd tend to look a lot alike, even in spite of our best intentions. And things don't really change all that much. But maybe you didn't fess up and you're one of the rare breed who actually does make New Year's resolutions and have actually followed it through to the fifth day of this New Year. Is anybody brave enough to say that they did that? No. <laughs> Uh, well, wherever you find yourself today, whether you make resolutions or not, it is a new year for all of us. It's a new decade. And I think it's good for us to agree that we probably all need regular checkups uh, to assess where we're at. And the new year just sometimes feels like a natural stopping point for us to be able to do that. And even that, just that action of turning the calendar over to a new year can feel like a fresh start that we want to take advantage of. And I think for those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus, I think it's even more important that we take that time to pause once in a while to get back on track on our, in our walk with him. Um, ever since grade three, I've worn glasses. And is Tiffany Sinerine here? <laughs> she can explain the physics and the math behind that. I did have brief visions of becoming an optometrist someday, but my grade 13 calculus mark, you know, just wouldn't have allowed that to happen. Uh, but anyways, over the years, my prescription got worse and worse. Mine is actually nine and a half, which I think is worse than that. Uh, it's so bad. When I open my eyes in the morning, I can't see m the numbers on my alarm clock beside my bed. That's how bad my vision is. And every eye checkup, um, that the optometrist puts that, you know, spacey device in front of my eyes and has you compare. Is one better than two? Is two better than three? Is three better than one? and on and on until we find the right prescription that helps correct my vision to give me 2020 vision. Yes, I'm sorry, it's very cliche. 2020 vision, 2020, the new year. I had to use it. When else can we use that? <laughs> but 2020 vision, isn't that our goal? Just like corrective eyewear, needs to factor in the unique needs of the vision problem it's correcting, I think in our relationship with God and engaging with Jesus will look really different for each of us. No two prescriptions are the same. So it's time. It's time for an annual checkup. It's time to evaluate where we're at with God and engage with Jesus in life-giving ways. So how do we do this? Well, there's this Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah, who I believe has some advice to help us as we do this checkup. And it's in Jeremiah 6 that we're going to be turning to. But first off, who was Jeremiah? Just to give a little bit of context. And what would we have to learn from him in 2020? Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet to the Israelite people in about the 6th century before the time of Jesus. This was not a good... 
um, periods in the history of the Israelites. They were involved in idolatry, worshiping other gods. There was a lot of unjust practices that they were involved in. And Jeremiah was sent as a prophet of God to warn them of the severe consequences of not obeying God. And he foretold that their enemies, the Babylonians, were going to invade them and overtake them and that they'd be forced into exile. And unfortunately, he lived to see that himself. So you're thinking, okay, what does this have to do with New Year's? This does not feel very hopeful. It feels really odd to pull a New Year's message out of this text, out of this book of doom and gloom. But as we head into the middle of chapter 6, there's this verse that stands out in stark contrast. It's just really hopeful and optimistic in tone. And it, it, it's just so hopeful that it just forces us to stop. It's jarring. Here's the verse. Jeremiah 6:16. 6, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask where the ancient paths are. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. And then his prophecy ramps back up into judgment for the rest of the chapter. And I feel like Jeremiah, he's just momentarily stopping his rant, and he gives this life-giving advice in the middle as he pauses to the Israelites. And I think this pause feels like a real invitation to me. And I thought it'd be helpful if we would stop and look at the action words in this verse as a guide for us to do this pause, to stand, to look, ask, walk, and find rest. And for each of these action words, there's probably a lot of different things that we could do, but I just want to offer a few practices or tools for each of these actions. And remember that, like that eye exam, the corrective lenses that I need to wear to see clearly might be different than what you need in order to see God more clearly as we enter this new decade. We need to engage with Jesus intentionally, but it might look different than the person seated next to you, or your spouse, or your friend. Stand at the crossroads. So notice that the first counsel is to stand, and standing involves stopping. And stopping gives us this chance uh, to evaluate where we're at with God. And that crossroads for us, that place where we're forced to stand, might be this new year. It just seems like a natural place. Or the crossroads might be a place of decision-making. Or the place where you're faced with a big life choice, choice. Or a change. Or maybe it's a conflict that you find yourselves at where you're weighing options and how to resolve it. So how do we follow this advice of Jeremiah to just stand? Well, there can be a number of practices. Sabbath, obviously, would be one of them, where you need to uh, disengage from work and regular activities. Sabbath encourages rest, and it gives us space to do those activities and those things that refresh our body and our mind and our spirit. Maybe it's retreat, just carving out a few hours or carving out a weekend with intentionality to create space to meet with God. This requires some forethought, and some planning, and some intentionality. Standing can also take the form of just quieting our heart and our mind before God to listen. And one such practice um, is called the breath prayer. And I find this one particularly helpful. Let's just unpack that one for a little bit. So a breath prayer is a short, repeated phrase that you pray over and over again. And it's a way of expressing um, a need or a desire before God and having our hearts open and receptive to how he wants to meet us in that prayer. So let me give you an example from my own life. So about 10 years ago, our family encountered our own set of crossroads. And a change in our circumstances meant that I needed to find full-time work really quickly. And the gift of a full-time permanent teaching position just essentially fell into my lap as a real gift from God. It was God's provision for our family in that season. I had trained um, years prior as a teacher, but after having a family and I was doing some corporate training and um, attending seminary part-time, I really never intended to go back to teaching. And the job that I got 
was teaching French to grade sevens and eights. So you can imagine uh, some of the challenges around that. And although I was really grateful for God's provision for that season, I wasn't enjoying myself, and I was finding myself getting increasingly grumpy and angry as the school year progressed. I didn't like who I was becoming in my attitude and in the way that I was treating the people around me. So my desire for change came in the form of a breath prayer. And for me, as I headed into that summer, my breath prayer was just, Lord, recreate me. I didn't have any other words. I just had to pray that prayer over and over again that summer. It was short and it was simple, yet it expressed my desire for Jesus to meet me, to change my heart and to recreate me into a better version of myself. And the painting here was a, a fr uh, my friend who's an artist. This is a visual representation of what that prayer was, recreate me. I was so desperate for him to change me and to make me more like Jesus in my day-to-day -day work. And no transformation suddenly came, but I began to sense a shift as I chose to stand and to stop and invite God to do his work in me. Another breath prayer that's been popular over the centuries of Christian tradition is what's known as the Jesus Prayer. And it just goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And this prayer has been used throughout Christian, Christian history as a way for Christians to engage in that ceaseless prayer that Paul talks about, that desire to just be in prayer at all times. So you just repeat it over and over again. And the beauty of this simple prayer is that it encapsulates in one phrase the entire good news message of Jesus, if we break it down. So the first word, Lord. Lord, we're declaring somebody else is the boss, that we are a servant to him, that we submit ourselves to him. Jesus. Jesus was the human name of God in the flesh. He came as a fragile human baby. He was raised by human parents. He shared our human experience. Christ. Christ is the word for Messiah, God's promised one, the one who would come to fulfill his promise to reconcile people to himself through the, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Son of the living God speaks to how Jesus was equal with God, one of the members of the Holy Trinity. Have mercy on me, a sinner. This declares our need for forgiveness and mercy as it's expressed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So as we pray this simple prayer over and over again, we're inviting God, we're inviting Jesus to make us new from the inside out with this gospel message. It's time for a checkup. So as we stand and stop at the crossroads, we evaluate our relationship with God, and we look for ways to engage with Jesus in a fresh way. Stand at the crossroads and look. Looking is the next movement. Looking and seeing what is actually before us and within us is a great way to evaluate our relationship with God. We look at what is. We look at the reality of our lives in light of God's ways and purposes for us. So some of the practices for this might include things like study. Study God's word. Read. Look into the scriptures. Uh, maybe it involves praying the examen, which I'm going to get into in a moment. Or really simple things like using nature or simple objects as visual cues and clues into who God is and to invite us into prayer. So let's look at that tool called the examen. This is a really simple way to pray, uh, to look over your past 24 hours with God. It's in three lenses that we look through the past 24 hours. The first one is just to simply replay the events and interactions of our day with God, asking him by his spirit to show us where he's been present in our day. And maybe it's been places that you missed him in the moment, but he reveals how he was there. And then the second movement is just to replay again the events and interactions. Where did I miss God today? And why? Was it because I just didn't notice him? Or was it because of my own defiance and disobedience? And then the third movement is just offering the day back up with all of its beauty and all of its mistakes and just giving praise to God for his pre presence, repenting where it's needed, and just soaking deeply in God's love. I find the examen really helpful for myself, and I try to practice it regularly before I go to sleep, just as a way of reviewing my day with God 
And uh, sometimes I use this app uh, that'll come up in a second, Reimagining the Exam, and it's just a great way to sort of walk you through the steps of how to do that. And I'm surprised that when I take the time to do this, how often God shows me how he was present, even though I didn't notice in the moment. Maybe it was through an interaction with somebody, or a song that I heard, or a song that was playing in my head. Or maybe it was through something beautiful that I saw, or maybe it was a gracious word that was spoken to me. Just a lot of different ways that he showed his presence. Another way to practice this movement of, be, of looking may be just that, to open our eyes and to look around us and to see how that can invite us into prayer. Uh, I think many of us are familiar with this verse from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies uh, proclaim the work of his hands. So it might be looking at a sunset and just being so impressed with how huge God is and the way that he chooses a different color palette every evening to paint the skies. And we're drawn into awe and wonder of who he is. Or maybe it's in the intricate detail of a snowflake, in the tiny, minuscule things, the detail God puts into that, and also how that inspires awe in us to offer up our praise. That he does that for snowflakes. snowflakes. Imagine how much more he cares for us. Another way... Um, of looking is just to use simple, ordinary objects as an invitation to prayer. So at my workspace at school, here's a picture of my computer, and I just have a few things there. I have a cross, I have a fish, I have a ladybug, and I have a little quote beside my computer. And this is at the front where I'm in front of the kids. And each of these invites me into prayer when I think of it. The cross just reminds me to consider Jesus, his sacrifice, and his deep love. And when I'm faced with 30, 13-year-olds, I need that reminder in front of me. The fish is a little carved uh, fish that reminds me of the story. It just reminds me to be grateful because it reminds me of the story where Peter was invited by Jesus to cast out the net. And there's a specific reference to the 153 fish he caught. And I think, wow, the specificity of that. And just my invitation to be grateful for the 153 blessings, the 153 ways that I can be grateful that day. The ladybug. This reminds me that I need to do the life of Jesus in community. This ladybug was given to me by a special friend, and it just reminds me of that every time I look at that. I need community of people to walk with me and encourage me in this life with Jesus. And then the quote. The quote helps me to soak in life-giving words. It's just from a podcast that I was listening to that week, and as I read it and I meditate on it, it just allows those truths to soak more deeply into my mind and heart. So it's time for a checkup. And I think looking can be one of those ways to help us evaluate our relationship with God and engage with Jesus in life-giving ways. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. Ask. So simple. The first two movements of standing and looking are more receptive postures where we receive. But now we become more active and we ask. Now we reach out to Jesus by seeking ancient paths, by discerning what the good way is. We ask and we wait expectantly for God to lead us. Ask for the ancient paths. So what might the ancient paths have been? Well, to the listeners of Jeremiah, it most likely would have been um, God's word that he gave to Moses, right? The law, the Torah. And I think for us, we could interpret that more broadly as all of Scripture and God's working with his people throughout the narrative of Scripture, all pointing to and culminating in the life of Jesus. The ancient paths might also mean looking at church history and different, uh, gleaning different practices from the streams of Christianity the moves of the Spirit throughout history that perhaps we're unfamiliar with. So there's time-tested practices like Lectio Divina and Gospel Contemplation, which I won't get into this morning. But there's so many great ways to soak in Scripture in meditative ways that could complement other forms that maybe we're more familiar with, like study or um, inductive methods of looking into the Word. Maybe the ancient paths is gleaning more from our Mennonite Brethren heritage, part of the Anabaptist tradition. There's beautiful practices of peace, 
and reconciliation and mutual discernment of coming around the word together and really discerning together. What is, what is the Spirit saying to us today through what we are reading? Maybe the ancient past <laughs> refers to Glencairn in your own history here. And there have been practices that maybe have been let go that you practiced in the past that you need to return to. Or maybe it's more personal. Maybe this ancient paths are spiritual disciplines that we ourselves have let slide, that we want to re-engage. Maybe intercession, or fasting, or serving, or giving. So we need to ask we need to listen and ask where the good way is. So this is the part that takes some discernment as I ask and I listen. Um, this verse is really formative for me. My understanding of the mystery of prayer and how it works in Romans 8 where it says that Jesus Christ is always at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. That's just so mysterious to me that why he's doing that all the time. But what it invites me to is that my prayers need to mirror what Jesus is already doing. So my job is to ask and to listen. Um, at our home church, WMB Church, we have this prayer usher uh, time in the service where anybody with any prayer concern can come forward and pray with somebody about whatever need that they bring that morning. And I have the privilege of being one of those prayer ushers. And when they come forward, I just simply uh, listen to what they share and then ask God, God, how would you have me pray for this person this morning? Uh, a few weeks ago, a woman came forward and I, uh, she shared with me just really briefly around uh, struggle with depression. And she was going through the good steps of getting some counseling and taking some medication, but she was still finding this depression so overarching in her relationship with her husband and her kids and in her work. And I just prayed as she shared, Lord, how do you want me to pray for this sister? And that word that she shared, that word overarching, just stuck out to me. And that became the fuel for my prayer. And I just pictured her under a blanket, an overarching blanket, just cocooned by Jesus to receive this season of healing and that he was taking care of all the other things in her life. So asking and listening enabled me to know how to pray for her. So asking for the ancient paths and asking where the good way is doesn't need to be complicated. It truly can be as simple as asking and listening. And this gives space for God to speak in the silence and to direct us in ways that might not naturally come to us. So as we evaluate our relationships with God, asking can be that first step in engaging with Jesus. Can we agree it's time for a checkup? Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask where the good way, or ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is, and walk in it. Notice the importance of the order here. Asking comes before the walking. This seems really simple, this seems really obvious, but how many of us are just like, we just want to get going? How many of us are willing to wait in that receptive posture of standing, looking, and asking before we actually act? And this action involves trust. Trust that God led us in those previous movements of standing and looking and asking. And now we're acting in obedience to what he's inviting us to do. So whatever crossroads we find ourselves at, we begin to walk in ways that reject destruction and embrace life. And we walk with others. Deuteronomy 31 are those famous words that Moses speaks over Joshua, who would eventually lead the Israelites into the promised land. The verse says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord himself goes before you. And I think it's a promise to us as well that we're never left alone. We're never called to walk into something that he himself has not gone ahead of us into. So how do we do this? Well, I think it's really simple and straightforward. We just ask and then we walk after we've heard. Take one step into the obedience that he's inviting us into. We're saying a hearty yes to Jesus 
and his life-giving ways and rejecting actions and behaviors that are destructive. Walking the Jesus way is choosing life. For our spiritual practices, this means engaging in behaviors that connect us with Jesus. But it doesn't mean that we do it alone. As Moses spoke to Joshua in front of the larger community about God's promised presence, we too need to seek God's presence in community. We need each other to make sure that we're hearing correctly what the ancient paths are, that we're discerning correctly what the good way is that we need to walk in. We need to encourage each other to keep going. We need others in our lives to know how to apply the ancient paths and the good way to our own walk. 2020. It's time for a checkup. It's time to evaluate where we're at and engage with Jesus in life-giving ways. And then the final movement, find rest. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. The initial movements of standing and looking were receptive postures. Then we took more action, and we acted, and we walked. And now we're invited by Jeremiah to go back full circle and be in a receptive posture again of finding rest. Um, finding rest is the fruit that comes naturally to us. Here's a tree. I don't think any tree produces all those kinds of fruit, but I like the picture. A fruit doesn't have to will, a tree doesn't have to will fruit into existence, right? It just happens. A tree's planted, it's watered, it receives sunshine, bees pollinate its flowers, maybe it gets pruned, and it produces fruit. It just happens. So too, I think this movement of finding rest is the gift that comes to us as we evaluate with God, our relationship with God and as we engage with him in really life-giving ways. That prayer that I prayed all summer for God to recreate me produced some fruit of rest. I was recreated in the sense that I was made aware of my deep need for God in order to do my work. I was recreated in the sense that I knew more fully it had to be his spirit doing his work in me. I was recreated in the sense of knowing that God went ahead of me into what he was calling me to do, even in spite of my own reluctance. The words of Jesus from Matthew 11 are familiar to a lot of us, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So Jesus offers us to find rest, but in doing this, he gives us this really odd image of a yoke. The yoke was this farming implement used to attach the necks of two animals side by side so they could pull a cart or they could plow a field. And I think this rest that Jesus offers us is not an escape, but it's a tool that links us to him. He offers us companionship at the crossroads. He provides us the promise of his presence, of his nearness, whatever we're being invited into. Our job in finding rest is just to stay near, just to be yoked to Jesus. That's it. So it's a new year, 2020. I'm going to say it again. It's time for a checkup to evaluate where we're at and engage with Jesus in life-giving ways. We long to see clearly with 2020 vision. So what if, what if we actually took the opportunity of this new year to have a checkup. If we took those receptive postures of standing and stopping where we're at and evaluating where we're at with God, what if we looked? What, if, what does it involve to stand at the crossroads and look? What does it take to have our eyes opened to see Jesus? Maybe looking back at our day and seeing God's movement is a simple way to look. Maybe it's using nature as a springboard for prayer or simple little objects as visual cues to invite us into prayer. And then ask, do we have this posture to ask and listen first? Or do we think that we know everything ourselves? 
Do we actively look for answers outside of ourselves in scripture, in the larger faith community? Do we provide space and silence to ask and then listen and then walk? And we need to take that small or big but very real next step of obedience. Do we trust Jesus enough to say a willing yes to the things that he's asking of us? Do we reject those things that are destructive and choose the life-giving ways of Jesus? And then finally, this gift of finding rest. We don't need to conjure this up, but it will come as a pure gift to us as we choose to yoke ourselves to Jesus and find that we're never left alone. So how clear is your vision as we head into 2020? Is it time for a checkup? Stand, look, ask, walk, find rest. And it's my hope that as we follow this ancient prescription of Jeremiah's that the God revealed in Jesus will come more clearly into focus for each of us. And maybe, maybe you need a completely new pair of glasses with a radically different prescription in order to see Jesus more clearly. Or maybe your prescription just needs a little bit of refining, refining of your practices in order to see Jesus more clearly. But either way, I think it's going to be unique to who you are and how you're wired, and it'll give you life. It'll be life-giving in your walk with Jesus. Can I pray for you? Thank you for this invitation to pause at these crossroads, to stand, to stop, to um, look at what you've placed in front of us, Lord, to ask and listen for the ways that you're leading us, and then to take that step in obedience in walking. And that we find rest in knowing that we're yoked to you, Lord Jesus, that nothing that you invite us into, you haven't gone ahead of us. And there's nothing that you invite us into that you're not walking with us in. So may that be an encouragement to each of us this morning to see how you're at work. May we each just take that time, Lord, to evaluate where we're at with you and to figure out ways to engage with you that really bring life to our spirits. So thank you for your presence among us and just continue to do your work, Lord Jesus, as we head into this new year. We look for you, we celebrate you, we give thanks for who you are. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we agree together. Amen.